Well, we got so much material to cover. Now, let me remind you that the, uh, the course really divides uh, into three parts. Uh, the first part, I tell you how I think the philosophy of language ought to be done, and that is essentially the theory of speech acts as an extension of the basic nature of the mind and consciousness and intentionality. And that, of course, is an extension of the uh, basic nature of the brain. So we're talking about uh, the whole account is naturalistic in the sense that we see language as part of the natural world. Uh, now, I have to emphasize that my use of the word naturalism differs uh, from the uh, a standard in contemporary philosophy, but I'm unwilling to give up on it. Uh, mostly, when people talk about naturalizing consciousness and intentionality, they mean denying their existence. Uh, naturalism is short for materialism of a very crude kind. Uh, and I'm rejecting that. I'm saying, no, a mind, language, society, consciousness, they're all parts of nature. Uh, they're as much a part of nature as photosynthesis or digestion. And what we have to show is how First, to show how consciousness and intentionality are natural products of brain processes at the same time as they are features of the brain. Uh, and if this was a course on the philosophy of mind, I'd spend a lot of time showing just that. Uh, and by the way, um, uh, the, the, the neurobiological profession is now agreeing with me. When I first got into this, they thought, well, you know, it's not really a scientific question. Uh, scientists can't talk about consciousness. Leave that to philosophers, mystics, uh, and theologians, and other people who are muddled and confused. Uh, but I think that's changing. I think people now recognize that consciousness and intentionality are natural biological phenomenon. Uh, once you give me that, then it's not all that hard to see uh, that language is an extension of pre-linguistic forms of consciousness and intentionality. Now, we don't know how language evolved. And we may never know because there's no fossil evidence. We don't have uh, fossils uh, where you can see, ah, here, yeah, here's uh, language. Uh, people often talk as if we did, but we don't really. So we don't know, in fact, how language evolved. But we know it did evolve. Uh, we know that there was a time when a whole lot of beasts, uh, we, let's call them hominids, because that's what they're called, uh, they were running around on the surface of the earth, mostly in Africa, and they didn't talk. And now uh, everybody's talking. Uh, there is no tribe in the world that doesn't have a language of some kind. Uh, and what happened in between? How did they go from being non-talkers to being talkers? Well, we don't know the answer uh, to that, but we know that certain things had to happen uh, because they did happen. Uh, we know that pre-linguistic forms of consciousness and intentionality in the form of uh, perception, intentional action, beliefs, and desires, uh, that those found linguistic modes of expression in the performance of the speech act and were often running with uh, the theory of speech acts and the development of syntax. And that's the first part of the course. Uh, and now the second part of the course, I try to teach you uh, mainstream, mainstream philosophy of language from essentially Frege to Kripke and Putnam and other uh, contemporaries. Uh, and I think it is a terrific achievement. I think uh, philosophy of language is probably the greatest achievement of analytic philosophy, along with Rawls's reinvention of the subject of political philosophy and therefore ethics. So the only rival uh, to the Frege tradition uh, is the Jack Rawls uh, uh, tradition in ethics. Those are the great achievements in philosophy over the past 100 or let's say the past 100 years. <coughs> well, Frege really goes back to the late 19th century, so maybe we should say 150 years. Uh, okay, so that's, I, I, I want you to learn that. Now, I do think that the whole uh, tradition is profoundly mistaken but it's not dumb. I mean, the tradition and the philosophy of 
mind, which just says, well, there's a mind and there's a body, and, and God knows we'll never figure out the relation between them, and maybe the spirit uh, is separable from the body, or maybe there is no such thing as a mind. I think uh, that's the philosophy of mind, and it's a hopeless set of confusions. On the other hand, it makes it more fun for me. I love teaching the philosophy of mind, because those guys are obviously wrong. I mean, starting with Descartes and going through behaviorism, and it's a lot of fun to point it out. Uh, whereas uh, the guys I'm arguing with in the philosophy of language, they're not obviously wrong. Uh, they're awfully smart. And last time we got on to Quine, and I'm going to tell you more about Quine today. Okay, so the second part of the course is mainstream philosophy of language, and you ought to feel pretty comfortable uh, with Frege, Russell, uh, Strawson's objection to Russell, Tarski's definition of truth. Uh, and all of that stuff going right up to externalism uh, with Kripke and Putnam and the other externalists. I will try to explain in more detail why I think it's mistaken. Uh, and part of today is going to be dedicated to that when I talk about Quine's behaviorism. But now the last part of the course is where I talk about applications of all this stuff to other issues. Uh, to fiction, uh, application of my theory of language to subjects like fiction and metaphor and pictures. I, I'm really interested in uh, what kind of a speech act is a picture and what can be conveyed by a picture. What are the limits of pictorial representation? The problem with pictures, uh, to put it in one sentence, is that though they're very powerful at conveying what they do convey, is they don't have the syntactical possibilities of sentences. You can't shuffle uh, the elements of a picture around with the ease that you can of sentences. Uh, and all you can actually depict is something uh, that looks uh, more or less like uh, the picture. Uh, and now that's going to open a lot of questions for us. And maybe we'll get to that today, though probably not. We have so many other things. Uh, to discuss. And at the end last time, I was talking about Quine's uh, philosophy of language, his rejection of the analytic synthetic uh, distinction, and his most famous result, which is called the indeterminacy of translation. And I'm going to pick up with that now and go on with that discussion. Okay, so I say all that to get you, uh, so you understand where we are in the material of the course. Now, alas, we're running out of. Uh, Time. I don't know how many lectures I've got left, um, but we get Thanksgiving this week, and then I think we get another week, and then in the last week, uh, they have. There's, I'm not supposed to introduce any new material. The problem is I don't remember what I've introduced already, so I'm not. I can't promise you I won't say anything uh, a absolutely new. Uh, but in any case, uh, basically this, what's. Uh, what there is of this week and next week is really the main part for introducing new material. Okay, Quine and the indeterminacy of translation. Are there any questions about what I just said, though? Any questions about uh, uh, the overall structure of the course, what we're trying to do, how things fit in, how <clears throat> my approach differs from mainstream philosophy? There are three ways in which my approach differs from mainstream philosophy. One, I want to see language as a natural extension of pre-linguistic mental capacities. Uh, and I, I tried to do that in that article, uh, What is Language? Uh, and that is a, an approach that's different from the mainstream approach. Mainstream approach doesn't see language as essentially an extension of pre-linguistic forms of intentionality. On the contrary, uh, philosophers like Davidson uh, say there's no such thing as prelinguistic intentionality. Uh, it seems to me incredible that he can say that, but he does say that um, uh, prelinguistic animals with no language cannot have propositional attitudes. They can't have beliefs and desires. Well, I can only say I didn't get him to. I didn't get Davidson to know Gilbert well enough, because if you want to see propositional attitudes, you want to see desire in action. Uh, come around our house when it's feeding time for Gilbert, and you will watch a manifestation of desire. And there isn't any question. You can't make sense out of uh, Gilbert uh, without supposing that he has desires. And beliefs, 
Uh, yes, he believes there's somebody at the door, or when I get home, I, he has definite beliefs, and they're really, you can't make sense of his behavior uh, without the assumption of beliefs. And it isn't just his behavior, but you know that he's got a brain structure relevantly like mine. You don't have to have a fancy theory of dog, of, of uh, canine uh, neuroanatomy to know that he's got a brain, and those are his eyes, and these are his ears, and this is his skin, and that these stand in causal relations to his consciousness and intentionality in ways that are relevantly similar to the way my brain and your brain stands to our consciousness and intentionality. Uh, okay, so you got to start with the fact that beasts like us have consciousness and intentionality. Language is developed from them. Uh, and now uh, that's the first way in which my approach to language differs from the mainstream. Now, the second approach related to that is I reject any kind of behaviorism, any view that says, well, really, all there is to language is dispositions to verbal behavior. Uh, we are, as Quine says, stimulated by nerve hits. Uh, and in response to nerve hits, he means, uh, 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 as the textbooks would say, uh, stimulations of the peripheral nerve endings by external stimuli. But Quine is good for elegant uh, summaries, and he calls that nerve hits. Um, and uh, in response to nerve hits, we are disposed to emit verbal behavior. Somebody says to you, is that a pen? And you will say, yeah, uh-huh, sure thing, you bet, and how. Now, uh, those are called affirmative allomorphs, and what we're now doing is heavy-duty linguistic science. See, I want to say the reason you emit those affirmative allomorphs is you agree. You have a mental state. You agree with the judgment that this is a pen. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Quine thinks there aren't any such things as meanings in addition to responses uh, to behavioral stimuli. There are behavioral responses and external stimuli, and that's it. There isn't any further story about meaning. Okay, now that's the assumption on which he proceeds. And he doesn't deny uh, that people maybe have mental states, but he thinks it's irrelevant. If we're going to do a science of language, if we're going to get a, uh, an account of language that will make the philosophy of language a respectable discipline, so you don't have to see him be embarrassed when you tell your friends in physics and chemistry what you do for a living, uh, if, we're, if it's going to be a respectable discipline, we have to deal with uh, objectively observable phenomena. And what is objectively observable is external stimuli and behavioral responses to the stimuli. OK, now Quine makes what he thinks is a great discovery. And the great discovery is the indeterminacy of meaning or the indeterminacy of translation. And indeterminacy here means there is no fact of the matter about what is the correct translation. And consequently, there is no fact of the matter about what the expression means. And his example became uh, famous, and I gave it to you briefly uh, last time. Uh, and that was the example we imagine uh, the anthropo anthropological linguist who goes into the jungle and he's trying to translate the native's language. And while he is uh, uh, engaged with the native informant, a rabbit runs past. And the native says what the linguist in his uh, phonetic script transcribes as gavagai. Now the question is, the native definitely said gavagai. What's the correct translation of gavagai into English? And Quine says, well, the natural assumption would be I, that gavagai means rabbit, or maybe there goes a rabbit, or lo, a rabbit. But Quine thinks about it and says, well, if we're just talking scientifically, about the stimulus that the native received and the uh, uh, behavior that the native emitted in the form of this utterance, Gavagai, 
then another translation that would be equally good is uh, undetached rock parts of a rabbit, because that's what the native actually saw, were a lot of parts of the rabbit that are undetached. Or maybe a stage in the life history of a rabbit. Uh, or instantiation of the Platonic universal of rabbithood. Uh, or an activity that some, something is engaging in called rabbiting. Uh, so that the correct translation into English would be rabbiteth. Okay, now says Quine, any of those translations will be just as good as any other translation because they're all consistent with the data. Furthermore, now this is where it gets tougher, they're all consistent with any possible data. No matter how much data you have, alternative and inconsistent translations will still be consistent with all of the evidence. So, says Quine, what should we conclude? Since alternative and inconsistent translations can be made consistent with all possible evidence, then, says Quine, it follows, there's really no scientific fact of the matter about meaning. There are dispositions to verb, uh, or dispositions to stimuli in the form of verbal responses, but there's no fact of the matter about which is the correct translation. What is the actual meaning in the mind of the agent when he uttered the expression? And this is supposed to be, uh, give us an extremely powerful, skeptical result in the philosophy of language. And it's supposed to refute people like me who think, well, sometimes we say something and we mean uh, uh, more or less something definite. Sometimes we succeed in saying more or less exactly what we mean. Uh, when I see a rabbit and I say, oh, look, there's a rabbit, I don't mean stage in the life history of a rabbit or one of those other possibilities. In fact, I never heard of those until I read Quine. Uh, so there really isn't any question for me about which one I meant. Okay. So here is the uh, result. The result is that if we adopt a scientific account of meaning, then there really isn't any fact of the matter uh, about meaning uh, I, because alternative and inconsistent translations can be made uh, consistent with all possible verbal data. Uh, one uh, a further comment about that. You might think, well, learn some more of the native language and learn is the same as and then the same rabbit runs past and you ask the guy using what you think is a translation for is the same as, is that the same Gava guy as before? And if the guy says yes, I, then you think he must mean rabbit and not stage in the life history of a rabbit because it's a different stage in the life history of a rabbit. Uh, but as Quine points out correctly, that won't do. Why? Because the same doubts we had about Gava guy we will have about is the same as. Because is the same as will admit of alternative translations uh, just as Gavagai did. So you're no better off than you were before. So we're uh, confronted with the fact that where meanings are concerned, there really isn't any fact of the matter. Uh, there's just uh, stimuli and responses uh, to stimuli in the form of behavior. But that's it. Uh, that those are all the, all the facts when you get to brass tacks. There's nothing left in addition uh, to that. And that means we, get, we come up with extreme skepticism about meaning. OK, that's the skeptical result. Now the debate begins. But I want everybody to see what Quine's argument is. Quine's argument is that alternative and inconsistent translations can be made uh, consistent with all actual and possible evidence. Therefore, there can't be any fact of the mat a matter about which one is right. Okay, now I'm going to go through the steps of the debate. You're going to see how people objected to this and what Quine responded. Uh, and basically, I'm going to argue, just to tell you the conclusion uh, of my investigation, that it's a reductio ad absurdum of Quine's behaviorism. What, uh, Quine starts off with behaviorism and gets an absurd result. Uh, now, one mark of a great philosopher 
uh, is that an absurd result is treated as a great discovery. I mean, uh, Frege discovered uh, that uh, uh, you couldn't refer uh, to concepts uh, with ordinary uh, noun phrases, and I would say, well, that, uh, then that is a, uh, uh, an absurd result because you can refer to anything. Uh, with a noun phrase, and Frege said, no, it's a great discovery that uh, uh, concepts are uh, I essentially incomplete and ungesetic, and you remember all that other stuff. Uh, okay, so I think Quine offered a reductio ad absurdum, a behaviorism, why? Why do I think it's a reductio ad absurdum? In order for you to understand the presentation of the example, you had to understand the distinction between meaning rabbit and meaning stage in the life history of a rabbit, or meaning undetached rabbit parts. You couldn't understand the example if you didn't understand those differences. But on Quine's own account, there can't be any difference. When Quine gives the example, I should have said, huh, difference between rabbit and undetached rabbit part? I can't hear any difference. Or stage in the life history of rabbit? Can't hear any difference, because uh, they're all the same on the Quinean account. All right, now we're going to see how the debate goes. Questions about what I said so far? How are you doing? Yes. Well, read my article. I'm not going to say anything in lecture I didn't say in that article. But, I mean, doesn't that mean that like, anything we say doesn't have any meaning? Like, I mean, there, is, there is a set of, of uh, stimuli, and there are a set of verbal responses. There's nothing in addition to that that is constitutive of meaning. There are no meanings in addition uh, to uh, the verbal responses and uh, the stimulus. Now, it's true there must be a mechanism in there that produces the verbal responses, but any mechanism would do. If you had a computer and it was, uh, you stimulated it, uh, its uh, uh, sensory receptors, uh, with certain kinds of stimulus, and the computer sped out gamma guy, then that's uh, all, uh, all there is to meaning. That is, the computer would have exactly the same mastery of meaning that you and I have, because that's all there is to meaning, is dispositions to verbal behavior in response to input stimuli. Yes, at the back, yeah. You have to talk louder, I'm getting deaf. Yeah. Well, what we have to assume is that the, uh, the guy's structure, uh, assume it's a computer, and we assume that the structure is the same. Now, there can be informants who got drunk or didn't pay any attention or walked away, uh, but they're like a broken computer. Uh, assuming the computer is in working order, and it says gabba guy whenever we show it a, a, a rabbit, it emits this sound gabba guy, then that's just like a human being. And now the question is, what's the correct translation into English? And Quine says alternative and inconsistent translations are all equally good. Now you might ask, well, what makes them inconsistent? And he says, well, the only sense in which, they, if, if they're equivalent, well, in what sense can they be inconsistent? They're inconsistent only in the sense that the translation that uh, one uh, translation manual will accept is different from what another uh, manual will accept. Quine talks about translation manuals, but I guess what he means by that is dictionaries and grammars. Uh, a, a manual for translating one language, a manual, say, for translating French into English, and he says that, that the sense in which the different translations are inconsistent is that one manual will give you one translation and another manual will give you a different translation. You see that there's a puzzle about what it can mean to say they're inconsistent if there isn't any fact of the matter to be inconsistent about. Yes? Like you said, it seems like you just have to spend more time in the field. I mean, I see the point that, like, yeah. it, on the first five minutes, you could come up with a million interpretations, but, like, in reality, it's, it's not to a specific meaning yeah. that you the ability to find out if you yeah. just put it in the work. Well, right? wait, now you're adopting what I think is the correct attitude. That's my attitude, namely, uh, that I, uh, there's something going on in these people's minds, and, that, and those are called meanings. They mean one thing as opposed to another thing. Uh, but that is what Quine is denying. Quine is saying, look, there, maybe there is, but it's no use to science. Science needs objectivity, and a science of language has to deal with objective facts 
and objective facts are facts about stimulus and verbal response. Now he says that's a behavioral ersatz. It's a substitute for the common sense notion of meaning, but that common sense notion of meaning is pre-scientific. It's, it's primitive. We've got to get a hard-nosed scientific account, and on our hard-nosed scientific account, we get the result that, well, really, there isn't any definite fact of the matter about meaning in addition uh, to stimulus and verbal response, but that means that alternative and inconsistent translations can be equally good. Okay, now there was an immediate objection uh, to Quine made by Chomsky. And I, in the end, I think Chomsky's right, but uh, Quine had an easy answer uh, to this. Chomsky said, look, what you're talking about, uh, the fact that you can have alternative hypotheses to account for the data, uh, that's a familiar point in the philosophy of science. You're confusing indeterminacy where there isn't anything with underdetermination. And there's a familiar point in the theory of confirmation that says under, yeah. um, I can't even spell this time of day, hang on, under, so, under determination, under determination. Okay, got it all. Um, I, and uh, there is a familiar point in the philosophy of science that says any hypothesis uh, can be made consistent with any amount of evidence provided you are prepared to make adjustments in alternative hypotheses, in, in, the, in the collateral hypothesis. So any amount of evidence uh, that you have I, I can uh, uh, be described using one hypothesis and then using a different hypothesis, uh, it's just you have to make further adjustments down the line. So for example, I, I have a hypothesis that I have ten fingers and I have a certain amount of evidence for that. But of course I could also say, yeah, but I may be hallucinating uh, or maybe I miscounted uh, or maybe there's a finger there that's so small I couldn't see it. So there's an alternative amount of, uh, there are an alternative number of hypotheses that can be made consistent with any evidence, but that doesn't show there's no fact of the matter about how many fingers I have. Of course there's a fact of the matter, uh, but the fact is that you can have alternative uh, ways of describing evidence about that fact of the matter. So uh, this is a familiar point in the philosophy of science. The evidence you have for an empirical hypothesis does not fix the truth of the hypothesis. Uniquely, there are alternative hypotheses that will still be consistent with the evidence. Now there's a famous example that we're all brought up on that's often misdescribed, but let me repeat it for you. Uh, the Ptolemaic theory uh, that says that the Earth uh, is the center of the planetary system and the sun revolves around the earth uh, was inconsistent uh, with the heliocentric theory that says that the sun is the center of the solar system and all of the planets revolve around the sun. Uh, and there was, as you know, a great debate. Uh, uh, this was a crucial development in Western intellectual history when we eventually gave up on uh, the Ptolemaic theory uh, that says uh, we are the center of the solar system in favor of the heliocentric theory that says the sun is the center of the solar system. Uh, now, here's how the story goes. In fact, of course, you can still make all the predictions uh, uh, come out on uh, the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic theory. It's just it gets incredibly complicated to do that because you have to postulate all kinds of uh, epicycles and so on. And, and what I'm telling you now is just standard text, textbook stuff. And I believe these guys when they say you can do it. Uh, but I'm not, I, I'm, I, I believe them 23 hours out of 24. But anyway, let's give them the 24 hours. Let's suppose, okay, you can really do it. But all the same, from the fact that both uh, Galileo and Ptolemy can be made consistent with all the observed data. It doesn't follow that there's no fact of the matter. There is a fact of the matter. It's just that alternative and inconsistent hypotheses can all account for 
uh, can account for all of the observed data, but there is a fact of the matter about which one is right and which one is wrong. Now, says Chomsky, what Quine has shown is not that there is an indeterminacy, but there's a completely familiar underdetermination of hypothesis by evidence. Alternative and inconsistent hypotheses can be made consistent with all actual and possible evidence. Now, Quine had an interesting response to that. He said, the underdetermination of meaning, the underdetermination of semantics, is underdetermination at one remove, and that's why it is not just underdetermination, it's indeterminacy. Because, he says, I, even if you decided what is the right physical hypothesis, I, and granted that the physical hypothesis under, is underdetermined by the evidence, all the same, the psychological hypothesis would still be underdetermined. But that is to say that there isn't any fact of the matter about the right psychological hypothesis. So Quine says, I agree about physics. Uh, physics is underdetermined, but it doesn't follow from that that there's no fact of the matter about physics. But when you're talking about meaning, you're talking about an underdetermination that goes beyond the underdetermination of physics, and that's why it's not just underdetermination, but it's indeterminacy. There is no fact of the matter. Now, that always puzzled me, uh, that debate, and Chomsky responded, I, I think correctly, what's the difference? If you fix the physics, yeah, okay, the psychology is under. Uh, determined, but fix the psychology, and uh, the physics is underdetermined. If you assume I, a, 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 a fixed physical account of the distribution and behavior of the particles, then you still haven't settled the issue about psychology. And if you uh, uh, fix the psychology, you say, no, the native meant rabbit, didn't mean any of that other stuff, then it's uh, uh, true that you still have left open the underdetermination of the physics. You still haven't described the distribution of the physical particles. Um, that was Chomsky's answer, and for a long time I thought that's the right answer. Who the hell cares if it's an underdetermination? Uh, physics or an underdetermination of psychology is still underdetermination and not indeterminacy. Now, but Quine didn't accept that, and it now seems to me that misses the point. Quine was assuming there isn't any such thing as the psychology. There's just the physics. And Quine says, look, when I say that it's underdetermined, that it's uh, uh, in indeterminate, what I'm saying is, if you knew all the distribution of the physical particles in the whole universe, you had a complete account of all the molecules in the whole universe, there would still be alternative and inconsistent translations of the native. You could still say either the native meant rabbit or the native meant a stage in the life history of the rabbit. So Chomsky is assuming, as I would assume, that there is a level of psychology, but Quine was denying that from the start. Quine was assuming all there is is physical particles, and the physical particles that constitute the native's body will respond uh, to a certain sort of stimulus. They will emit the noise gavagai, and now there are alternative in, uh, and inconsistent translations of gavagai that can be made consistent uh, with all the distribution of the physical particles. But Quine is assuming all the facts in the universe there are are the facts about the distribution of the physical particles. There aren't any additional psychological facts. So now what's going on? Now we need to go deeper into this and see what I think is the real reductio ad absurdum of this whole approach. Now why are we doing this? Well, first of all, it's been very influential. A lot of people think uh, uh, Quine has absolutely refuted guys like me who think there is such a thing as meaning and there's such a thing as saying rabbit and meaning rabbit and the truth to tell you, I've never in my life meant stage in the life history of the goddamn, well, forget about it, but anyway. Um, I, 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 this is an important issue in the uh, philosophy of language and so you should understand it and understand how my approach differs. 
Okay, now Quine goes on after this discussion and says, you know, there's an odd uh, consequence that we haven't thought about, and that is if there's an indeterminacy of meaning, then there would be an indeterminacy of reference. Sense determines reference, right? So if there's no fact of the matter about whether the native meant rabbit as opposed to undetached rabbit part, so there's no fact of the matter about whether the native was referring to a rabbit or referring to an undetached rabbit part. Why? Well, for reasons I told you, sense determines reference, and we use this same argument. I use the same argument when we talked about relativism about truth. If you got relativism about truth, you got relativism about reality. Uh, because, of course, uh, of this quotation. Uh, the disquotation will give you, uh, if there's no uh, uh, a absolute truth about uh, snow is white, then there can't be any absolute reality about snow is white, because that's because of disquotation. Snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. Now, analogously, if there's no fact of the matter about whether the native meant rabbit, then there can't be a fact of the matter about whether the native, whether the native referred to a rabbit. But now it's getting worse and worse because now it looks like, well, if there's no fact of the matter about either meaning a rabbit or referring to a rabbit, then there can't be any fact of the matter about being a rabbit. And there won't be any difference between being a rabbit and being an undetached rabbit part or stage in the life history of a rabbit. And that, says Quine, is absurd. Quine correctly sees that his account leads to absurd consequences. But what he's going to do is rescue it, and I think the rescue fails. Now, there are, uh, uh, there are two, there are three slogans. One is the indeterminacy of meaning. Translation here is just short for meaning. But the second is what he calls the inscrutability of reference because the underdetermination of translation leads to the fact that reference is now inscrutable. It's undecidable uh, because there can't be any difference between referring to a rabbit and referring to a stage in the life history of a rabbit. But that's going to lead to weird consequences about ontology. Will we have an underdetermination of, uh, an indeterminacy of ontology? Will there, will there be a difference between being a rabbit and being a stage in the life history of a rabbit? Uh, and Quine comes to the rescue with the doctrine of relativity, the relativity of ontology. Uh, and here's how the argument goes. Uh, Quine says it's true that reference will inherit uh, the uh, indeterminacy of meaning uh, because, uh, for the reasons I just told you, uh, if there's no difference between referring, uh, between meaning rabbit and meaning stage in the life history of rabbit, then there can't be any difference between referring to a rabbit and referring to a stage in the life history of a rabbit. But now we're in trouble because what then is the difference between being a rabbit and being a stage in the life history? And Quine says, we've got to get out of this absurdity, but we do it by recognizing that reference and existence are all relative to the selection of a translation scheme. We have to decide on what we're going to regard as the translation scheme, and then that will give us a way of treating reference as determinate and ontology as uh, fixed, but as fixed, but only relative to the translation scheme. And what should we do? Quine says, "Well, let us di just." acquiesce in our mother tongue. Quine has these elegant expressions that give you the impression that he's saying something clear, but it isn't uh, clear uh, for reasons I'm going to tell you in a minute. Quine says we just acquiesce in our mother tongue and just uh, happily uh, 
a guess on in English. And we'll say in English, well, the guy meant rabbit. Uh, and that's why he was talking about rabbits, and that's why rabbits exist, but only relative to the selection of a scheme, only relative to the selection of a scheme. So we get a really spectacular result out of the indeterminacy argument. Existence is relative to the selection of the, of the uh, translation scheme. It's relative to the existence of the translation manual. Uh, now, I think all of that is, does not solve the reductio ad absurdum. See, here's the structure of the argument. Uh, Quine gave us an argument that I think is a reductio ad absurdum of behaviorism. It, I, if, if the argument were right, we shouldn't have been able to understand it. If, the, if there really is no difference between meaning rabbit and meaning stage in the life history of a rabbit, we couldn't have understood the Gava guy example in the first place. I, I, Quine sees that this is going to be a problem because he sees that it's a problem about uh, not just meaning but about reference and ontology. Now Chomsky comes in and says, well, there's no difference in physics and psychology, but Quine in effect is denying the existence of the psychology. He's saying there's just the physics. But if you adopt just the physics, then you get the inscrutability of reference uh, that there isn't any difference between referring to a rabbit and referring to a stage in the life history of a rabbit, and there won't be any difference between being a rabbit and being a stage in the life history of a rabbit. But Quine is going to rescue us by identifying relativity. And the relativity of meaning and existence and reference is going to be just like the relativity of space and time. It doesn't deny uh, that we've got uh, that there can be uh, things we're actually talking about when we talk about how fast was the car going. But you have to understand speed is always relative to the selection of a coordinate system. Now exactly analogously, meaning and existence are going to be relative to a coordinate system. And Quine says we got a coordinate system, just acquiesce in our mother tongue English. Now I think none of that works for reasons I'm now going to explain and, uh, but first, Mike is going to uh, ask a question. Yeah. No, I, just don't, I just don't get the relationship between the inscrutability of reference and the relativity of ontology. Yeah. But it seems like, like from the fact that it's say, indeterminate whether I'm referring to apples or oranges, it doesn't follow that there's no difference between apples and oranges. Yeah. Well, the, it, looks, uh, it looks like Quine is relying here on the principle of disquotation. Uh, that is to say, uh, the guy meant apple and not orange will imply uh, 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 the guy referred to apple and not orange. Uh, and then that will, reply, will imply the thing that's there that the guy was talking about was an apple and not an orange. Now that, I, I'm just repeating wine. You go read his text or read my, read my refutation of his text first and then read his text because I think it'll be easier. See, I'll tell you what happened to me historically. I was writing a book on intentionality, which you're familiar with. By the way, is there anybody here who's good at Arabic? Uh, uh, because uh, you're good at Arabic? I'm not great at it, but I just... Okay, I just got an Arabic translation of intentionality, and I'd like somebody to look at it. It scares the hell out of me to think, my God, you know, what, why God knows what they're doing to me. But anyway, I'll, sh I'll show it uh, to you. I would like somebody who's good at Arabic to check out the translation. Um, anyway, I... Uh, uh, I was writing a book on intentionality in which uh, I adopt a kind of naive view. Yeah, we all have beliefs and desires, and we mean rabbit when we say rabbit. At least I mean rabbit when I say rabbit. And here I got all these guys like Quine saying, no, that's all uh, uh, pre-scientific superstition. Now, another attacker was Kripke, uh, who picks up on Wittgenstein and says, well, really, uh, there aren't any facts about meaning. It's all just a leap in the dark. Uh, you rely on other people, but his complete skepticism about meaning. So I thought I had to answer both these guys, so I wrote a huge long article about Quine, and it's in your reading. It's uh, uh, in uh, Martinich. I hope it's in the edition you got. He keeps changing the edition on me every couple of years. But anyway, I want you to read that article. And I also wrote an answer to Kripke that's not in that volume, but it's in other stuff, and maybe I'll put it on my website. Uh, okay, so I had to do that, and now this is where we are with Quine. Quine is saying, look, we got an absurd result, but I'm going to rescue us by doing what any good uh, Einsteinian physicist would do. 
postulate that the apparent absolute character of space and time is really relative to a coordinate system. So the apparent absolute character of meaning, reference, and existence is similarly relative to a coordinate system. Okay, and that's his answer, and I'm now going to uh, attack that. I'm going to say that doesn't really solve the problem. Yes? Yeah, here's how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Remember this quotation. The snow is white is true if and only if the snow is white. Uh, now, analogous, you, you could say, the guy meant snow if and only if he referred to snow. And you could say, well, the guy referred to snow if and only if snow exists to be referred to. Snow exists as the object that he is referring to. Now, Quine is saying similarly, if there's no fact of the matter about meaning rabbit, then there's no fact of the matter about referring to a rabbit. But if there's no fact of the matter about referring to a rabbit, then it looks like there's no fact of the matter about being a rabbit on the other end of the referential expression. Now, this is a, I, I think this is a mistake that's very common in our intellectual history. Um, a, a standard misunderstanding of the, uh, of the argument between Galileo and uh, the church authorities is to say, well, really, there isn't any fact of the matter about the solar system. It's just simpler uh, to say that we revol resolve, revolve around the sun rather than saying the sun revolves around us. I, I don't know if you were uh, brought up on that when you took your freshman physics course. I was. Uh, it's a hopeless confusion, but that's the story they gave us is, well, really, science doesn't tell us the truth. It just gives us a simpler uh, device uh, for making predictions, and the device given to you by Copernicus and Galileo is simpler than the device given by Ptolemy. But you mustn't think that one is true or the other one's false. That's wrong, and I'm, I'm now going to uh, show why that's wrong in this particular case, in the case of meaning. But right now we got to the point where Quine is in a quandary. It looks like he's got a ridiculous result that there won't be any fact of the matter about being a rabbit or being a stage in the life history of a rabbit. But science to the rescue, relativity to the rescue, meaning, reference, and existence are all relative to the selection of a coordinate scheme. And what's the coordinate scheme? Well, we acquiesce in our mother tongue. Our mother tongue is English. Okay, I'm now going to show you that does not work. Yes? Yes, uh, but now, uh, says Quine, I, it's just more convenient uh, to, uh, to use uh, the mother tongue uh, and to make uh, the, the translations uh, that seem most natural given our mother tongue. So the most natural translation of rabbit would be, uh, of Gavagai would be rabbit and so on with other things. A, a guy once wrote to Quine, uh, who was an actual translator, saying how helpful uh, Quine's uh, thesis of indeterminacy had been when he goes out to deal with the natives. And Quine wrote back and said, you didn't understand me at all. I wasn't suggesting that this is how anthropologists should actually work in the field. Uh, because the anthropologists who are working in the field has got to make a whole lot of assumptions which are not scientifically uh, determined, but which are practical assumptions. Yeah, the guy thinks like I do, so he's likely to think that's a rabbit and not a stage in the life history of a rabbit. By the way, all this was inspired by Pike. There was a great uh, linguist at the University of Michigan named Pike. Um, and uh, Pike uh, w was good at taking a language he'd never heard before uh, and uh, learning it on the spot, learning it. Uh, uh, he, he had a kind of genius at this. And he would do these public demonstrations. He came to Berkeley, and he'd stand in front of an audience like this, and they'd get some guy to come in uh, who ha ha Pike had never seen before, and the guy spoke some obscure uh, Amazonian or African or Central Australian language, and Pike would then learn that language on the spot. Pike would have, he'd hold up a stick, and the guy, 
uh, would say something, and then Pike would write it on the blackboard, and then Pike would get Pike would do what Quine called radical translation. Uh, radical translation is where you translate another language into your language, and you have no uh, third language that you can translate into. That is, if they both speak French, well, then that's cheating. But you have to have a guy who speaks not a word of your language, and you speak not a word of his language, and you learn it on the spot. And Quine was struck by how this works and was asking, well, what kind of evidence does he get and what substantiates the evidence? Now, Pike uh, said it doesn't always work. Uh, uh, so, for example, a guy, uh, a, a Pike holds up a stick and asks the guy, you know, what about this? And the guy said, well, that's the thing you hit horses with. Um, well, but that's no good. But then Pike doesn't know what to do uh, with that long expression. He was hoping the guy would say the equivalent of stick. But in any case, this was what inspired uh, Quine. Uh, but it's not meant to be practical advice. It is a theoretical, philosophical analysis of the notion of meaning. Now, what I want to show to you is that this answer, the relativity of ontology, doesn't rescue uh, the theory. Quine says we should acquiesce in our mother tongue. Our mother tongue is English. But on Quine's own account, our mother tongue is the home of indeterminacy. Because, of course, if translation is indeterminate, then meaning is indeterminate at home. There isn't any difference in English between saying, uh, between meaning rabbit and meaning undetached rabbit part. That was the whole point of Quine's behaviorism. You can't say, look, there's no fact of the matter about the native language, but there is a fact of the matter about English. English is just another example of indeterminacy. So if there's no fact of the matter about the Gabba Guy language, then there can't be any fact of the matter about English. So if you say acquiesce in our mother tongue, our mother tongue is indeterminate on his own account. It's cheating to say, oh, well, we'll assume fixed meanings in English and then uh, translate from another language assuming those fixed meanings because the argument that there were no fixed meanings in the other language is an argument that there are no fixed meanings in English. So it doesn't rescue the thesis to suppose uh, that um, uh, we can just assume fixed meanings in English because the argument is to show that there are no fixed meanings in any language at all. Uh, and I think the analogy with uh, uh, on t uh, the relativity, uh, uh, the relativity of physics, the relativity theory in physics, is just a, well, I don't want to speak strongly, but it's this sort of bogus scientism. Let me take questions in a second. I want to get this out. Uh, you see, take a case where it really is relative. We're driving along the highway, and somebody says, "How fast are we going?" Uh, and I look at this phenomenon, and I say, "We're going um, 60 miles an hour." But I notice we're passing a truck, and I've got a meter, and it says, no, we're going five miles an hour. Now, there's no real inconsistency there, because we're going five miles an hour faster than the truck, but we're going 60 miles an hour relative to the surface of the Earth. Different coordinate systems give you different speeds, but there's no inconsistency. There's no inconsistency by, sa by saying, we're going five miles an hour relative to the truck, and 60 miles an hour relative to Highway 80, and 700 miles an hour relative to the, uh, 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 the position of the sun, because the Earth is going east at about, our part of the Earth is going east at about 700 miles an hour all the time. Anyway, I, so different coordinate systems give you different results, but they're all perfectly consistent. But you can't do that with language. And I imagine in this same car that there are two French speakers and I say rabbit when we see a rabbit in the field next to the car. And one guy uh, says, uh, uh, stade de lapin, a stage, in a stage of a rabbit. And the other guy says, parti non détaché d'un lapin. One guy says, part of a rabbit. And the other guy says, uh, 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 st one guy says, stage in the life history of a rabbit. And the other guy says, uh, undetached part of a rabbit. Now, if, one, if they're Quine followers, they'll say, well, each translation is just as good as the other. Uh, one translated my saying uh, rabbit as stage in the life history of a rabbit, and the other one translated as saying undetached part of a rabbit, but they're equally good because they're equally consistent with the evidence. Now, I want to say what I think is obvious. They both got it wrong. I speak French well enough 
uh, to know, no, I didn't mean stage in the life history of a rabbit, and I didn't mean undetached part of a rabbit. They're just mistaken. What's wrong with the relativity analogy is there isn't any such thing as speed except relative to a coordinate system. But that doesn't show there isn't any such thing as meaning except relative to a coordinate system. Why? Because the coordinate system has to identify previously existing meanings. That is to say, that I meant rabbit, or that I meant stage in the life history of a rabbit, exists prior to whether or not we're translating that from one language to another. Now, Quine thinks, well, no, this is the old myth of the museum, the idea that there are these mysterious entities called meanings. That's not the point. Take any theory of meaning you like. Uh, the point is that the meanings that you identify will exist independently of this or that coordinate system, as is shown by the fact that the same meaning can be expressed in either French or English. The correct French translation is lapin. Uh, and not partie non détaché dans lapin or a st uh, stade de lapin. Those are just bad translations. And the reason they're bad translations is that there is a fact of the matter that I actually meant rabbit and not stage in the life history of a rabbit. So Quine's uh, attempt to appeal to uh, the relativity of ontology in order to rescue the observed results of these other views does not seem to me to succeed. Now what happens in the subject is that people get kind of dizzy at this stage of the argument. And if you're not dizzy, you're probably falling asleep. Uh, because I think it does make you kind of dizzy, this whole, the abstract character of it. But I think really the, the, the hidden agenda in Quine is the idea uh, that really there, uh, you can't uh, assume the notion of meaning uh, to have an explanatory value. We just have to be behaviorists and assume that uh, all, there are, all we have to go on are nerve hits, uh, that's the stimulus, and external behavior. And uh, what I'm arguing, in effect, is if you do that, you get an absurd result. You get an absurd result that there's no fact of, not just that there's no fact of the matter about what the uh, agent meant, but there's no fact of the matter about what he was referring to and no fact of the matter about what exists. And all of those, I believe, are mistaken. Okay, I spell that out in more detail uh, in that article that's uh, assigned in uh, the Martinish volume. It's called Empiricism, Indeterminacy in the First Person. I'm sorry it has such a boring title, but anyway, uh, there it is. So let's take questions about that. I saw some other hands up. Yeah. 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 No, here is the problem. I uh, there are all these particles. I uh, and we divide them up uh, some into rabbits uh, for example. And the question is, what, how can we justify the division into rabbit? What fact makes it a rabbit and not a stage in the life history of a rabbit? And Quine says that fact can only exist relative to a coordinate system in exactly the same way. Uh, the fact that I'm going 60 miles an hour can only exist relative to a coordinate system. I am objecting to that. I'm saying the analogy with physics breaks down because there isn't, anything uh, 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 there isn't anything such as motion except relative to a coordinate system. But there is such a thing as meaning, because the same meaning can be preserved in different coordinate systems in English or French. And this is illustrated by the fact that the guy who translates me one way in French and the guy who translates me in another way in French are both wrong. They're both wrong about what I actually meant. How do I know that? I know that because I speak French well enough to know exactly what I meant in English and exactly what I meant in French, and I know those translations are wrong. Now, why can't Quine say that? He can't say that because I'm supposing that there is such a thing as meaning in addition uh, to, a, uh, uh, 
uh, dispositions to respond verbally to stimuli. Now, I, what's the deep disagreement then is this. I think you can only explain the dispositions to respond to stimuli if you assume meaning. The reason that I responded when the guy said to me, did you mean rabbit? and I respond by saying yes, the reason I respond in that way is because I mean one thing rather than another. In other words, meanings have to explain the behavior. You can't use the behavior to explain the meaning. The behavior is explicable only on the assumption that the agent meant certain things and not others. Okay, well, I'm going to leave Quine now. I, I mean, maybe we can come back to it next time. Yeah. What? Can you the, the title of your article? Yeah. It, it, uh, don't you have Al's book here? Al Martinich? It should be in it. Fifth edition. There's an article by me, by me called Empiricism, Indeterminacy, and the First Person. If it's not, I'll put it on the website because it's, it's in the... Uh, it's in there. Okay. If you have Martinich's book, The Philosophy of Language, there's an article by me that's assigned, and that's what I've been talking about today. It's called Empiricism, Indeterminacy, and the First Person. And what I'm arguing is that you have to assume uh, the existence of the of first person, of, uh, that, that I am in a privileged position about what I meant. Why? Because speech acts only are performed from the point of view of the agent. They only exist from the point of view of the agent. If it turns out uh, that uh, while I'm snoring in my sleep, a whole lot of sounds come out, uh, that does not, they do not constitute speech acts performed by me because uh, they are not intentional behavior on my part. Okay, well, yeah. Um, so just to play that was added to Yeah. <laughs> right, so part of your response is, I think, well, I know that when I say rabbit, I mean rabbit. Yeah. The um, so client responds, sure, of course, your word rabbit means the same as your word rabbit. Yeah. Well, what he actually says is that there can't be any fact of the matter about what's the right translation. But that means there can't be any fact of the matter for me about what's the right translation of my language into my language. Uh, that is, there can't be any fact of matter about me when I said rabbit that I meant rabbit and not stage in the life history of a rabbit. Now, that sounds like a crazy result. And Quine says, well, just acquiesce in your mother tongue. In your mother tongue, you would say, I saw a rabbit and not I saw a stage in the life history of a rabbit. But I want to say, yes, and where does the mother tongue get its determinacy? Because on his account, the, the phenomenon of indeterminacy is absolutely general. See, it follows from the behaviorism. And all the talk about guy was just a picturesque way of... Uh, of illustrating the thesis, but it's supposed to be completely general. If there is no fact of the matter about meaning except stimulus and disposition to verbal behavior, then there can't be any fact of the matter for me about whether or not I meant rabbit or stage in the life history of a rabbit, and that seems to me an absurd result. Now you might say, well, uh, if, if I say, if suppose I use rabbit and hare to mean the same thing. They don't mean exactly the same thing. Uh, but let's suppose I did use them to mean exactly the same thing. Then Quine would say, you don't have a scientific explanation of synonymy any more than you had a scientific explanation of meaning. I guess what I'm really trying to say in one sentence is this. The real distinction between Quine and his opponents like me and Chomsky is that Quine is assuming that all there is is behavior uh, and dispositions to behavior and external stimuli. That's it, nothing else. And I did debate this uh, with Quine once in public, and he said, all we have to go on is surface stimulations of nerve endings. That's it. Now, that looks like it's a sort of great discovery, but this is characteristic of the history of philosophy, is people will pick their favorite uh, ontological preference. And so they'll say, all we have to go on is molecules. Well, sure, everything's ma made of molecules. Uh, Quine says, all we have to go on are nerve hits. Somebody else in another tradition might say, well, all we have to go on 
is the Befindlichkeit and Geworfenheit of Dasein in the Lebenswelt or whatever. You know, they're different philosophical traditions. And I'm saying what looks like a great discovery. You know, I got as much Geworfenheit as the next guy. Uh, I, what looks like a great philosophical discovery is just a preference for a certain level of description. And uh, what I'm saying is if you accept Quine's preference for behavior, you get these absurd results. You get the... Uh, the indeterminacy of meaning, the inscrutability of reference, and you don't, rec you don't uh, get out of those messes by appealing to the relativity of ontology because the whole point was there is a fact of the matter about whether or not I meant rabbit as opposed to stage in the life history of a rabbit. And we had to assume that in order to get the discussion going in the first place. Now, in a way, there's something paradoxical about this because I'm arguing against Quine's uh, doctrine of relativity, but my own view has an even more radical kind of relativity, and that's to the background. Uh, you have a set of background uh, capacities and abilities, and this enables you to pick out rabbits, but in a radically different uh, a kind of universe, your language might not be able to function. That is, if rabbits uh, constantly coalesced uh, into, uh, you got a whole bunch of rabbits and they coalesce into one, or they suddenly uh, undergo fission uh, and uh, produce uh, a whole uh, a yard full of elephants, let's say, uh, we might be stuck. We wouldn't know how to describe the situation. So your ability to use language at all, on my account, is going to be relative uh, to a set of background capacities and your ability to cope. And, and these background capacities will involve certain kinds of presuppositions. Okay, I want to turn from Quine to Chomsky now, if you can bear it. I mean, it's maybe two heavy-duty thinkers in one day, but let's do it. Let's go to Chomsky. Uh, now, about 50 years ago, actually, yeah, 53 years ago, uh, Chomsky revolutionized uh, the study of language. Uh, and he has continued uh, to be influential to this day, uh, but there is an odd, there's an odd puzzle about the legacy, and that is after 50 years, it's very hard to say what are the established results. Uh, Chomsky wanted to give us a set of rules that would generate all and only the sentences of English. Chomsky's investigation was about syntax, and Chomsky thought there must be a set of rules that we all uh, have mastered. He doesn't want to say we learn them, but we have mastered them. Uh, we have mastered the rules of English syntax, and these rules will generate all and only the sentences of English, and the task of the linguist is to make those rules fully explicit. Okay, now the, here's what's worrisome, and that is uh, after 50 years of very serious investigation, uh, there is no such set of rules that competent linguists agree on. Uh, so what's going on? Well, let me identify some things that I think uh, Chomsky did succeed in establishing, and then I'll show you some of the difficulties in the rest of the investigation. Uh, Chomsky was struck by the fact, uh, and by the way, he's not the first person. Uh, this was a common observation in the 17th century. Uh, Chomsky was suck, stuck by the fact that small children, prior to any adequate intellectual development, are able more or less effortlessly to acquire whatever language they happen uh, to find themselves in. So if you had all been born in China, you would have all picked up Chinese. If you had been born uh, in Germany, you would all have picked up German. Now what's going on? This is a remarkable fact that the child acquires and notice I say acquire rather than learn. We're going to talk about learning later. The, child acquires an enormously complex system. He acquires uh, the ability uh, to understand and to produce sentences in a system that is incredibly complex. So the system is complex, but furthermore, 
the evidence that the child gets is degenerate. Uh, why? Well, very few parents actually speak in grammatical sentences. And indeed, most people uh, that you're familiar with don't speak in grammatical sentences. They'll start a sentence and then, oh, uh, well, they'll think, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, well, like, uh, and, and if you listen to people, it's embarrassing to listen to these great sports heroes that I admire uh, on the television after they won the World Series because it turns out most of them are unable to speak grammatical English. Uh, their favorite expression is, you know. And as epistemologist, I want to scream, but I don't know. That's why the guy's asking you the dumb question, because I don't know the answer to it. But, you know, they say, you know, you know. And they can say it over and over. Uh, all right, so there are all kinds of noises uh, that people make. And by the way, the secret of learning to speak French is to make the right noises. If you say, eh ben, uh, every so often, people will have the illusion you speak pretty good French. You see, in, in any other language, if somebody asks you a question and the answer is yes, you say yes. But in French, you say, eh ben oui. Uh, and that uh, authenticates you as a, uh, and if the, if the answer is no, you look at them as if they were total idiots. And you say, shaking your head, you say, mais certainement pas. Ho. And then you say, Pierre, come and listen to this. Pierre, viens écoute. And then you present Pierre with this absurd question that you have been confronted with. Anyway, uh, so what I'm saying is people uh, get degenerate evidence, and this has a name uh, in the literature. It's called a poverty of the stimulus. Uh, the actual stimulus that you hear is impoverished in various wage ways. OK, you have a, a complex structure, degenerate evidence, and then uh, at a stage of early development, uh, the child is not cognitively developed. Uh, and you, the child can't learn all kinds of things that would be nice. The little kid at the age of one or two will start learning English effortlessly. Try to teach axiomatic set theory. Kid, I want you to learn von Neumann set theory here. Doesn't work. Von Neumann set there is much easier than English, much simpler, but children will learn English and they will not learn axiomatic set theory. It's an early stage of development that the child is able to pick up uh, this language uh, and any language that the child is confronted with. And another interesting feature is uh, it's, you don't have to teach the child the child will just pick it up. Uh, you don't have to, there need not be any effort to teach. Uh, middle class parents sometimes have the illusion that they taught their child how to speak English, but uh, they don't have that anymore because they all been to college and they <laughs> heard a lecture like this. Um, I, but, but there are some exceptions. I'm still convinced that I taught Billy Boy how to speak English. He's my little brother. Uh, but in any case, he's now a professor of English. Uh, but in any case, uh, it, it, you don't have to teach the child. Now, there are interesting variations on this, though. You have to interact with a child. If you plop the child in front of a television set, the kid will not learn a language. Uh, the kid has to be, there has to be interaction. There has to be some sort of human uh, interaction. So it's not taught. It comes at a very early stage of development. The stimulus is impoverished. It's complex. And furthermore, uh, the learning is not a function of intelligence. So smart kids and not so smart kids both acquire the same language. Now, it's true, the smarter kids tend to get a bigger vocabulary. Uh, they tend to know more big words. Um, uh, but they don't uh, have, uh, 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 there's no difference in the basic structure of the language. They both learn that sentences have noun phrases and verb phrases, and that the, uh, the noun phrase dominates the verb phrase as far as the conjugation of the verb and so on are concerned. So you get, uh, it's not a function of general intelligence. Uh, and then uh, you, other facts here that are um, uh, very important, and one is that it must be learned at a certain stage. List that as six. Uh, 
there must be a certain stage. If the child gets to adolescence without acquiring a first language, it's very hard uh, to teach the child after that. There's a certain stage of maturation at which the child will learn a language and not otherwise. It has to be done at that stage. Uh, it has to be done, uh, roughly speaking, between the age of one and uh, 10 or 11. Now, in my own case, I spoke very late. Uh, I didn't say anything until I was about two and a half. And everybody was worried except my mother, who was a medical doctor, and she you know, was perfectly familiar. Not, it's not to be worried about. But um, I, it, 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 children develop differently, but they must develop by uh, adolescence or you're in deep trouble. I'll tell you a horrible story about a girl in LA who was kept in a closet until she was 14. It's a ghastly story, but I'll, I'll save it till after Thanksgiving. Okay, now I want to draw the bottom line of this discussion, and that's this. How is all that possible? And Chomsky's answer is, in a sense, the kid knows the language already. The kid has programmed into his or her brain a universal grammar that will apply to any language. So there's a sense in which you don't learn uh, English or French when you acquire it as a first language. Rather, you have a stimulus that triggers the pre-existing grammatical capacities that are structured in your brain. And this is called the thesis of universal grammar. And there are some acronyms that are always crop up here. You have to assume, in order to account for that, that the child has a language acquisition device known as a LAD, the language acquisition device. And the language acquisition device consists of a universal grammar. Now, the traditional answer to that was always, but languages are so different. English is so different from Chinese. Chomsky's answer is, they're not different. At the bottom, at the deep structure, they're all the same. If a linguist could come from Mars and travel around the Earth, he would say, they're all, they all speak the same language. It's just they have different vocabularies. But basically, the, all the language have sentences. They all have noun phrases and verb phrases. The noun phrase dominates the verb phrase. So the, all, the, all the languages on Earth are basically the same in their deep structure. And we could under, if we can identify that deep structure, we will have discovered the universal grammar that's common to all human languages. OK, have a good Thanksgiving. When we get back, I'll tell you what was wrong with this.